The Secret of Guidance by F. B. Myers, Chapter 5, Why Sign the Pledge? The feeling in favor of total abstinence from strong drink is rapidly growing. By the efforts and self-sacrifice of tens of thousands, a strong public sentiment is being formed, like a mighty breakwater, and arrest is being placed on the onward march of drunkenness, and many a bark, battered by the fury of passion and self-indulgency, is safely moored in the haven, sheltered from utter ruin, and able to repair its total terrible wreckage. Happy are we who live in such a time. Let us do our best to build our few stones in this great breakwater, which is only made up by the small work of unknown and soon forgotten builders. One important means by which so much has been done has been the use of the pledge. Humanly speaking, if it had not been for the pledge, the present sentiment in favor of total abstinence would not have been possible. And it will be a great mistake if the signing of the pledge should ever fall into disuse or become an object of contempt. We must not kick away the ladder by which we have climbed up. And yet in some quarters there is a disposition to think and speak lightly of the pledge. Oh, says one, I can keep teetotal without signing your pledge. Yes, another says, it is childish to sign away your freedom. It may be all very well, says a third, for some to do it, but it is not so for me. Why, then, should we sign the pledge of total abstinence? Sign the pledge. It is your protest against strong drink. It is time for every thoughtful person to enter a solemn protest against strong drink, which every year is inflicting such awful havoc among our race. Who can be indifferent to the woes it brings on hearts and homes, on villages and towns, on countries and continents? Well, may the Hindus call it shame water. There is not a house in which you may not find it slain. There is not a newspaper that does not record its diabolic outrages. There is not a public officer that could not blame their damning evidence against it. We can do so much, but let us do what we can. We have a voice, a right to cry, a or nay, a power to assent or protest. Let us use them by all means on the right side. And if we can not express our feelings in any other way, let us at least sign a solemn declaration on paper that we will never again touch the cruelest foe that ever re revealed its uh, human tears and blood. Sign the pledge. It may benefit your health. health. Alcohol is not more necessary to health than any other chemical or med medical um, medicinal agent. It excites the heart, hinders digestion, disturbs the liver, and stupefies the brain. It gives a momentary glow and stimulus, but you have to pay for them afterwards in an inevitable lessening of vital heat and animal power and mental force. Even in modern quantities, it acts as an irritant and a poison. The athlete can training for a boat race, a prize fight, or a running match must absolutely forego the use of alcohol. And if men do not want it for such extraordinary exertions, why do we want it for ordinary ones? Recent English expeditions in the Transvaal and Egypt proved that if a general wishes his troops to perform forced marches or to undergo unusual fatigues, he must substitute coffee for grog. The extremes of the Arctic circles and the tropic suns are best endured on cold water, as the experience of many explorers and travelers proves. The tables of insurance offices show that 100 moderate drinkers die for every 73 abstinence, and many offices have a special section to give abstinence the benefits of insurance at a less price. It would be a perfect revelation to some who read these words if they would give total abstinence a trial. Your appetites would be better, your minds would be clearer, your nerves would be stronger, and your whole system would give fitness and tone. Sign the pledge. It will save your, save your time. We have only one short life to live, and you cannot afford to fling the diamond moments into the rushing streams beside us. How many days in the fore part of the week are spent by our working classes and saloons, which are a dead loss to them and their families in the countries? How many hours are spent by clerks and commercial travelers in the course of the week at the bars of railroad stations and restaurants, which might be sown with the seeds of golden harvest? How many evenings are worse 
then wasted in a convention, conventional company, which might have been spent in an innocent and health-giving recreation or in acquiring knowledge, which would unlock many a shut door. From all this, you would escape if you signed the pledge. Sign the pledge. It will save your purse. Sit down and calculate how much you spend per day in doing, not only for yourselves, but also for those whom you treat. It will amount to a respectable sum in the course of the year. Add to this the money you might earn in the time you now lose. Add to this all the sums squandered wastefully in the company into which habits of drinking lead you. And when all is put together, would it not make a nice nest egg against a rainy day or for illness and old age? I often say to those who sign my pledge cards that there is a 500 note hidden inside the double cardboard. Sign the pledge. It will save you from temptation. You will have no in, in, intention of becoming a drunkard. You scorn the thought. But there is a risk of you becoming one as long as you tamper with the drink. You take it now for the sake of society, but you will come to take it for your own sake. You cannot be sure that daily drowned drinking may not do for you what it has done for, for countless in exciting a thirst, not perhaps dormant, but which, when once aroused, will be unsexual. Wise men, good men, strong men have been mastered by that awful thirst, who do who no more expected such a thing than you do. It is not is it not folly then for you to run the risk of creating it? Why not stop at once before that thirst has been aroused? You tell me that it seems hard for you to do without the drink then that is a sure sign that the accursed appetite has got a foothold within you. Spring off the car ere it brushes down the incline. Run the boat into a creek, here's it might call it into the rapids above the falls. Force the cloven foot back out of the door before the demon has time to thrust the whole body into your heart and life. Do it at once, do it now. You ask not to be led into temptation, then don't go into it. Saloons are well called shades and vaults. They are the shadows of death and vaults for the burial of all that is noblest and best in man. Avoid them. Pass them by. Refuse to enter them unless the good shepherd in saddles you there to find your lost sheep. Sign the pledge. It will make a definite starting point in your history. In all efforts after a better life, it is well to have some landmark or time mark to which to look back and from which to date. There is a sort of satisfaction in being able to point to a mental stone carnet or sea line or white painted post standing out on the moorline of life and to say, up to that point I lived a selfish evil life, but since then I have tried to run fair and well by the help of God. With some it is a sermon, with others it is a birthday of death and entry into the diary or a New Year's Eve. With others it is the visit of some gospel temperance advocate to their town. But in many cases, the same purpose is served by signing the pledge. The date of that pledge card is a birthday, a new start, a beginning of a new era in the song of the soul, and it very often leads to the second step of faith in Christ. Signing the pledge makes a strong obligation. When a man gives up the drink, he must do all that he can be done to strengthen his resolution. If he simply makes a resolution, he feels at liberty to withdraw from it if he chooses. But if he has double knots his resolution with a solemn promise to which he has put his hand, then he feels bound by the most solemn obligations. He cannot think of breaking his word. He dare not violate his plight trough. And in the moments of temptation, his self-respect, his love of truth, his desire to be a man of his word, his written vow will be a strong reason for saying no. A gentleman who signed the pledge card recently said, that during the whole of the next day he carried it in his pocket and took it out 15 minutes to remind him that he had put his hand to a promise which he dared not violate and could not retract. Sign the pledge. It will give a significant answer to those who tempt you to drink. There is no answer that a man can give so good as this. If he refuses because he is hot, he will be advised to drink to get cool. If he refuses because he is cold, he will be recommended to drink to get warm. If he refuses because he cannot afford it, his companions will gladly treat him. 
If he refuses because he is not well, there is no ailment to which flesh is heir, for which intoxicating drink are not prescribed as a certain cure. Men who are well drink till they are ill, and then drink to get themselves well again. None of these excuses avail, but if a man says, I have signed the pledge, they may think him a fool, but they cannot say that he has not given a significant reason. And if they are true men themselves, they dare not ask him to break his word. If a man asks you to drink after you have signed the pledge, he is no true friend. He is doing the devil's work. He is certain to turn around and insult you after you have done his will, because he will have lost the last fragment of respect for you. There are some men who, who must have a reason to give others for doing as they do. Here, at least, is a clear, straightforward, intelligible reason, which puts an end to controversy and settles the matter forever. I have signed the pledge. Sign the pledge. It keeps it from becoming the badge of recommended drunkard. If the pledge were only signed by men who had been drunkards, but who were not who were trying to live a new life, it would become a pledge of recommend, reclaimed drunkards, and it would soon cease to be signed by this class of men who need it most. This would be a great calamity. I did not sign the pledge, says a young doctor to a friend who was trying to get him to do so by means of saving him from ruin. Why not, was my friend's reply, because if people heard that I had done so, they would say that there must have been a screwdish in my character and that I was a reclaimed drunkard. No, said my friend, they never can say that, for it has been signed by thousands of thousands of those whose characters have never been a stain. The answer reassured him. He took the pledge and is now an earnest Christian worker in one of our large towns. You may not need to sign the pledge for yourself, but sign it that you may give it the benefit, the weight, the standard of your own moral character. If even one of a reputable and stainless character were to sign aloof, the pledge would be a hopeless failure. Every respectable Christian person who signs it is like one of the cords floating on the surface of the sea, helping to restain, retain the heavy nets laden with fish. Sign the pledge. It makes it easier for others to do so. We are creatures of fashion. We cannot help it. We were made so. What one does, the others are apt to do. There's many an eager eye looking to see what the reader of uh, these lines is going to do. If he signs the pledge, that boy, that companion, that servant will do the same. But if he refuses to do so, it may be that that waiting one will also refuse, and that refusal will lead to ruin. More eyes are watching us than we think. More lives than we know are on the balance, waiting for the feather of our example to return them this way or that. Are we right in leaving anything undone that might save one of whom Christ died, we must use all means to save some, though the use of the means compel us to forego some boasted liberty or some loved indulgency. Don't say that you have no influence. It is only an excuse. You have, you would not like others to, to say that. I have no influence, said a man, to one who asked him to take the pledge for the sake of others. His wife came up at that moment and said, That's true. You have no more influence than a cat. If you say that again, woman, he said, I will knock you down. Of course, you have influence. Use it well. Sign the pledge. It will win you friends. We all need friends, and if you have given up those who gather around the drink, we need others, and are most likely to find these whenever they are pledge cards to have had signatures. It is all well, very well to resolve to give up drink and to keep the vow secretly, but it is much better to take the pledge in the presence of one or more persons who shall bear witness to what have they have seen and who will be bound to you in the bonds of a new and common brotherhood because they have done the same thing and are pledged to the same cause. Objections. But I do not like to sign away my liberty. Then if you are unmarried, you will never be married. You will, sure, you will surely never promise to love and honor any one individual because you may want to change your mind. And what is true in this case is true in another and is a significant answer to the objection. If you like, take the pledge for a short time only, as you take the lease of a house. You can easily renew it again and again, or better still, promise to abstain by, by God's help from all intoxicating drinks ever as a beverage until you return your pledge card to the friend with 
from whom you have received it. It will give you an opportunity of relinquishing it when you choose, and it will give him an opportunity of speaking earnestly with you when your purpose is faltering. But I may be forced to drink. If you are, you will not violate your pledge. You only promise to abstain from intoxicants as a beverage. If it is a poured down your throat by force, or when you are fainting, if the physician compels you to take it, if you take it unawares in some dish of cookery, your pledge is not broken. It is not you that break it. But I have taken it and broken more than once. Then take it again in humble dependency on the Savior, who has been manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Most, if not all, total abstinence pledges lay stress on the words, God helping me. These words are the heart of all. If they are not felt deep down in the soul, the pledge is not good for much. It rests on mere human strength. But when God is appealed to, the case is altered. Divine power pours into the spirit which is lifted up to him in prayer and trust. Angel hands are stretched out to hold back the erring feet. A holy garrison is put inside the weak and trembling nature to hold it against the foe. Ask the Lord Jesus to forgive the past. Ask him to save you from your enemy. Ask him to shield you in the day of battle. Ask him when the door is nearly battered in to put his foot against it and keep it closely shut. He is able to keep you from stumbling. He is able to keep that which you commit to him. He is able to make you more than a conqueror. Put yourself into his hands before you leave your room in the morning. Keep looking to him all day. Praise him for his grace each night. What's that? That you keep mumbling to yourself, said a working man to another at a little distance from him in the same shop. I keep on saying, Lord, help me, was the reply. I say it night and day. It is the only way I know of how of to keep down my thirst for the drink. Take heart, my friends. The battle may be sharp, but victory is sure. And when once you stand firm on the rock, be on the alert to rescue others from the raging waters of strong drink.